March 6, 2012, take one. March 6, 2012, take one. Right. Let me get sticks. All right, Chomsky interview, March 6, 2012, take one. Okay, so we have the Occupy movement currently. And we want, I want to um, ask about the importance of solidarity globally. It's been inspired by Egypt, the Arab Spring, and Spain. Now let's take Spain. Um, you're familiar with Orwell and the Spanish Civil War. And you've said that the cooperatives that existed then were, couldn't succeed because of the fascist, communist, and democracy threat or uh, impediments. Yeah. Um, so, do you think? Let's imagine that this spring, the Occupy movement can do the hard work of appealing to, organizing, and empowering the ninety-nine percent, the working class and the poor, and that we can involve and inspire them in this practice of participatory direct democracy. Given the global power structure, how do you think the United States? Do you think the United States is the most vital place for this work to be done? And how profound do you think the implications of an American spring would be for the hood, occupy the hood, the global south, the 99%, and the ecosystem itself? Well, that's first of all a very big if. Uh, but if, in fact, you could expand the Occupy movement, if we all could, to include uh, uh, the workforce, communities, uh, uh, places of production, and commercial enterprises, and media, and so on. It would be a major revolution, which would uh, dramatically change the world. But of course, there would be plenty of efforts to uh, to uh, restrain it. Power systems don't just give up easily and say, you know, thank you, and we'll go home. Uh, so it's a, it would be a huge enterprise. In Spain, remember, it, uh, it was preceded in Spain by you know, decades of uh, organization, uh, trials, uh, crushing of efforts by violence, restarting them, uh, an educational, uh, the liber libertarian educational system, uh, in fact, the, when the time, moment came uh, when it was possible to sort of put it in action, it was really in people's heads. So all over the place, people sort of knew what to do, and they were dedicated to it and committed to it. Uh, so that we're a long way from that. Take the civil rights movement. We have organizing, you know, with SNCC at the you know in the '30s, the '40s. SDS, um, I mean SCLC, and then comes SDS. Um, we have influences from, you know, like Jim Lawson, Reverend Lawson, organizing kids and Gandhian principles, kind of. Occupy Boston had the big statue of bronze statue of Gandhi out there in Dewey Square. How powerful do you think, and tactical, do you think this nonviolent? philosophy is? Well, it's, it's certainly the, uh, what one should prefer. Uh, some prefer it to the extent of never being willing to do anything else. So, for example, Martin Luther King wanted to just keep to it strictly, nothing else, not even self-defense. Uh, others have a less rigid view. And they're also more uh, complex conceptions of nonviolence. So one of the uh, leading figures in 20th century American nonviolent movements, uh, kind of a mentor of King and others, was A.J. Musty, who's not too well known, but he should be. Uh, he, uh, he was a nonviolent pacifist. He was pacifist during the Second World War. But he advocated what he called revolutionary pacifism. He said that it's not if you, pacifism in the face of injustice is not enough. Uh, so uh, as he put it, unless you confront uh, the 90% of the violence, 
which is essentially the structural violence of ordinary life, uh, then it's uh, uh, hypocritical and meaningless to object to the uh, fringe of violence that you know, that we're uh, 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 by uh, more marginal groups who are struggling against uh, injustice. We should object to what they're doing, but we can't take ourselves seriously unless we're confronting the 99%, the exploitation, the repression, uh, the whole system of violence under which most people try to survive somehow. And that includes uh, uh, violent repression, but also just you know, what's sometimes called structural violence, uh, the system of exploitation and subordination. So that's revolutionary pacifism. Uh, and uh, it can be a very effective force. Sometimes it is. Uh, take, say, the civil rights movement. Uh, its record is instructive. Uh, the, uh, as you said, it goes back decades. Uh, it really began to take off a little bit in the 1950s, the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, uh, Rosa Parks, and so on. But it really uh, became, uh, began to become a national movement in the around 1960 with uh, uh, sit-ins at lunch counters by black students, you know, arrested, uh, returned in larger numbers, uh, uh, freedom buses with young people mostly uh, riding through the South trying to organize voters. It was, uh, it was pretty violent, not, not the demonst and SNCC, as you say, that was kind of like at the forefront of it. Uh, the, uh, they were joined to some extent by act young activists from the North, and it was pretty brutal. Uh, people were killed, beaten, tortured. Uh, finally, it got to the stage where uh, there was enough popular support nationwide so that it did impel the government to uh, pass significant legislation uh, which extended beyond uh, the rights of uh, the black minority. So it was the beginnings of legislation which kind of broke the framework of uh, repression of women. After, if you look at the law back in those days, the women were basically property, mm -hmm. the property of their father or their husband. Uh, That's kind of the way the legal system was structured. In fact, it wasn't until the mid-1970s that women even had a guaranteed legal right to serve on juries because they were not competent to that. Now, all of these things started to collapse. It became a man. It sort of interacted with the uh, uh, activist movements that were developing at the time. And it was part of the whole uh, kind of revolution of consciousness that took place through the 60s. But you take the civil rights movement itself. Uh, by 19, well, take Martin Luther King, who became the symbol of the movement, in many ways the leading figure. Uh, he uh, was, uh, 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 as I said, A.J. Musty was his mentor. He was committed to revolutionary pacifism. Uh, and uh, by 1965, uh, by not famous, you know, if you listen to the speeches on Martin Luther King Day, they usually end with the March on Washington in you know, the 1963. I have a dream, and so on. But he had a much broader dream. And right after that, he began to expand uh, the activities of the civil rights movement to the north. That didn't get very far. First to the Chicago and anti-slum movement, uh, to housing, uh, jobs, and so on. He uh, op began to speak openly about the Vietnam War, he harshly denounced, denounced imperialist wars, uh, he uh, confronted directly racism and oppression in the North, and his popularity sank, and the civil rights movement fractured and sank. Uh, Northern liberals were quite willing to support condemnation of racist Alabama sheriffs, but uh, they didn't want to look at what was happening next door. And uh, as he was uh, I'm sure you know he was assassinated when he was uh, uh, joining uh, a sanitation worker strike, public servant strike, and on his way just about to uh, 
uh, organize a, a march to Washington of the poor, and part of an effort to establish a poor people's movement. Well, the march took place after the assassination. It went through the places in the South where there had been bitter, brutal struggles. Finally, they ended up in Washington. The marchers uh, uh, set up a tent city, uh, I think it was called Resurrection City. Uh, Congress, the Northern Liberal, Liberal Congress, uh, simply dismissed them with uh, contempt. Uh, the security forces were called in to drive them, forcefully drive them out of the city, uh, just to make it clear who was boss. They came in the middle of the night and tore down the tent city and drove the people out. And that was the end of that. You know. So it went on uh, as long as it had, as it was directed against an enemy who power systems wouldn't defend, or at least not defend very much, then it was successful. But it, uh, in order to go beyond that, it would have to have far broader uh, appeal and uh, support, and that's hard. As soon as it took up class issues, then the power system crashed down on its head, and it ran up against, uh, you know, uh, prejudice, racism, uh, uh, lots of unpleasant attitudes, which are do exist throughout the population. Can't deny it. And this is, in, and you mentioned the tent city, like we.